for IFT uh, weekly colloquia. So uh, just to explain that, Gustavo, uh, <laughs> every time <laughs> uh, when we have an event here, like a school or a program, uh, we take advantage of having you know, the top people in the world to ask them to give a colloquium to us, to the whole community, so not mm -hmm. only to people participate in the program or in the activity. And uh, so today it's a pleasure to have here uh, my friend, Professor uh, Christophe uh, Grosjean. And uh, let me say a few words about uh, uh, Christophe. So um, Christophe actually has some um, indirect uh, uh, link to this institute because uh, Christophe uh, did his PhD and his uh, advisor was uh, Carlos Savoy. And Carlos Savoy was uh, in Paris, in, in Saclay, and Carlos Savoy was a master student here at this institute, a uh, student of a professor that maybe many of the students here do not know, Professor Zimmerman, who is an emeritus professor uh, now at, uh, at the institute. And uh, so there's this indirect link of uh, Christophe with uh, our institute. So after, after the PhD, uh, Christophe uh, went for a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, he was a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and then uh, uh, he was a staff member of, uh, of SACLE for uh, 10 years. And, in, 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 and from 2006 and 2012, he was a staff a scientist at CERN. And actually, I'm very grateful because he hosted me in my uh, <laughs> sabbatical year. It was a very exciting year because that was the year when the Higgs was discovered. And after CERN, uh, he got a permanent position at uh, ICREA. Uh, he was a research professor at ICREA from 2012 and 2014. And since 2014, uh, he's a member of the DAISY theory group. So DAISY uh, is the Deutsch uh, Electronin Synchrotron. I'm not sure if the <laughs> German is correct, maybe not. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he's also a professor at Humboldt University in Berlin. So uh, Christoph, um, uh, has worked on various topics in particle physics beyond the standard model. He's a specialist in the physics and dynamics of the Higgs boson and its possible, in its possible incarnations, and has worked on several different aspects of the Higgs boson. And also, he uh, is working in close contact with experimentalists to establish you know, what, uh, what should we do next after, after the LHC. So he's the right person to talk about the, uh, the Higgs fabrics. Uh, he will explain the title, I guess. Once and in the future. Thank you, Christophe, okay. for accepting the invitation. Well, thanks a lot, Rogerio, and thank <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's over already. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I would like to tell you a little bit about yeah, the X fabrics that fill the universe, but also about the fabrics that will make the, the X in now and in the future, right? Um, so first of all, I will start with a little exercise for you, right? A physics, a classical physics exercise. Um, you know that often, I mean, the athlete has, similarly to the physicist, he always wants want to break the records, right? I mean, to go faster, to jump higher, etc. And the exercise is the following. I mean, I will ask you to compute how, how high um, a human can jump with a, with a wooden stick, right? with a pole, right? Because when I was a kid, I saw it's easier, you know, just take a, a longer stick and you will clearly jump higher and higher, right? Fortunately, I mean, I, I learned a little bit of physics and say, concluded that it was not really possible. And the reason why it's not possible to go higher and higher is simply because you have a conservation of energy, right? At the end of the day, what you're doing when you try to jump higher is simply to convert your kinetic energy into gravitational energy, right? So using simple laws of, uh, of Newton, you will really realize that you can jump a, um, a length delta h, which is given by the square of the speed divided by this uh, gravitational acceleration. Right? So now you look at how fast a human can, can run, right? It's Usain Bolt. You, you reach 44 kilometers per hour, sometimes in Berlin in August 20, uh, 29. And this converts to, to a height of uh, 7.62 uh, meters, right? Which you know, the, the world record is something like 7.2 meters or so. so 7, 26? 6. Oh, 6. Yeah, uh, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so this means that they are already pretty, pretty efficient when you're really converting this kinetic energy into gravitational energy. Um, so 
clearly this is true for, for human, but <laughs> there is similar laws, conservation laws, you know, for, and that describe also the, uh, the behavior of a particle, right? And there have been a remarkable breakthrough in the understanding of nature at the beginning of the uh, 20th century that basically all the forces among the particles are really associated to symmetries, right? So this is the case, for instance, of the conservation of energy, which is related to the invariance of uh, time translation. And the electromagnetic forces are also associated to the local invariance by phase rotation of the particle wave function. Right? So that's really the way we now understand how the particle interact with, uh, with each other. You just associate some symmetries and some conservation law. Right? And that clearly led to the standard model of particle physics. So uh, the symmetry that really govern uh, the particle um, motion and the particle interaction, as far as we know today, uh, associated to the Lorentz symmetry plus some internal symmetry, which are simply SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So this clearly um, comes from the combination of uh, spatial relativity and quantum mechanics. So uh, standard model, SM, is really the contraction for spatial relativity and quantum mechanics. Right? And under this uh, framework, basically a particle is nothing else than a representation of the Poincaré group, which are labeled, according to the coleman mandula theorem, by simply some numbers, you know, the spin that is, that is telling you how the particle transforms under the Poincaré group, uh, a mass, which is also an invariant of the Poincaré group, plus some internal quantum numbers, you know, that, as I say, should, should represent the transformation on SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And a priori, this is in good agreement with data. You know, all the particles that have been observed, the quark and the lepton, uh, you can really associate all those, those numbers, you know, the spin. So all these particles are spin one half. They have the masses here that you can measure. And you know, we have understood clearly all the quantum numbers of all these particles. So this is in good agreement with data, except for the fact that the spectrum, you know, in particular, all this mass spectrum, is actually incompatible with the Carroll nature of the symmetries, right? So I will come back in a moment what I mean by Carroll, right? So here, all these fermions are actually Carroll, so this will imply, in principle, that the mass should also vanish. And the same is also true for the gauge boson. If you look at the transformation of the gauge boson, you will see that um, it should have a mass which is equal to zero in order to be compatible with this trans transformation law, right? So before I explain actually to you what um, this chirality really means. I mean, I want to, to comment on the fact that in molecular biology, also chirality is an essential ingredient for life, for life to emerge, right? And according to the current understanding of, of biology, this chirality seems to be an emergent property. You know, it's really a phenomenon that occurs at low energy. And for particle physics, it's still an open question, you know, whether chirality is really a fundamental property at very high energy, or whether it's something that really emerges only at low energy. So this is still an open question. The other question is, of course, whether chirality of the weak interaction has anything to do with chirality in molecular biology, right? That's something that doesn't seem to be true, but maybe, you know, people will understand it better, right? So what is this chirality? So uh, chirality is really the fact that um, particles don't interact in the same way under um, in, in weak interaction. So weak interaction is responsible for the decays of the, uh, of the nuclei. So Mrs. Wu in, in 1956, you know, did this experiment. She looked basically at how big um, nuclei of cobalt were actually dying you know, or, or basically decaying in a strong magnetic field. And what she noticed is that actually <laughs> Uh, the electron that emerged from this decay of this, of this cobalt atom and uh, cobalt nuclei were only coming in one preferred direction, uh, in the direction of the magnetic field. And the opposite direction was never observed. And you know, the fact is that those two configurations are actually symmetric under each other under parity when you, when you change the direction of, uh, of space. Right? So this is clearly a clear indication that the weak interaction, which is responsible for this decay, actually break and break parity. Right? So that's exactly what we mean by, uh, by chirality. So the weak interaction actually break, break parity, right? So this is something that is very specific to the weak interaction. For instance, in, in, in electromagnetism, you know, you don't see the difference um, between left and right. So I think it's only an accident in the sense that, you know, you call electron, I mean, the two particles that are the left-handed electron and the right-handed electron. Um, because it transforms exactly in the same way under U1 of electromagnetism. But under the SU2 of the weak interaction, they are totally different particles. They have totally different interactions. Right? 
So in principle, there should be two names for these two, two quantities, right? So, yeah, so chirality, uh, as I explained to you in the introduction, I mean, chirality, in principle, forbid uh, any mass for the particle. And the reason is simply uh, a combination of quantum mechanics with, with special relativity. So quantum mechanics, indeed, is telling you that for particle of spin s, you expect 2s plus 1 degrees of polarization. For the electron, which is spin 1 half, you have two polarization. So you have an electron that spin clockwise and, um, in the direction of motion, and an electron that spin anticlockwise, right? But of course, you know, the notion of spinning clockwise or anticlockwise depends on the way you are looking at the particle, right? If you are moving faster than the particle, you know, you will see the particle spinning in the, in the opposite direction. So this means that if you really want to give a meaning you know, to the chirality of the particle, then the particle has to be massless. It means that you can never go faster than the particle. So this is why if you have chirality, then you expect a, a massless particle. But of course, we know that, I mean, the electron has two chirality and has a mass, right? So there is a problem. There is a problem between those, those two uh, experimental facts, right? And the solution to this problem is actually uh, the understanding that those symmetry are spontaneously breaking, uh, spontaneously broken. So this means that the short distance interaction are actually different than the long distance interaction. And how do you realize that? Well, you. <laughs> It's simply um, a consequence of the, of the fact that yeah, the vacuum, right, the set of lowest energy, actually is, shows, uh, is, chosen, uh, is choosing one particular direction that breaks this SU2 cross U1 symmetry down to U1 of electromagnetism. So the fact that you have a vacuum that breaks some symmetry is really something which is non-trivial. You know, it cannot really occur in quantum mechanics. You know, for instance, you take this a very well-known example of a double well potential, you say, well, maybe the vacuum you know, will sit in one particular uh, minimum of this potential. But actually, the true vacuum is a superposition of the state that are localized in each of these two minima. Right? So in a sense, uh, the vacuum is not breaking this uh, Z2 symmetry that exists in this potential. But spontaneous breaking can occur in, in quantum field theory when you combine really quantum mechanics with, uh, with uh, special relativity. And at the end of the day, I mean, in, in the case that we are interested in for, for the standard model, so you have a, a symmetry of the Lagrangian, which is SU2 cross U1, and then you have a field, the X, the X field, that take an expectation value, right, that breaks this SU2 cross U1 down to U1 of electromagnetism. Right? And the excitation of this field is nothing else than the X boson that was discovered at CERN 10 years ago, while it was, I mean, postulated uh, in 1964 by uh, Peter Higgs, uh, brought on Anglais, right? So it took quite some time to discover this particle. So as I say, I mean, this is a solution of this, uh, of this mass conundrum, right? And this is something that you can look uh, quite um, beautifully experimentally. Indeed, you can you know, report the mass of the various particles and the interaction with the X boson. And you see that for all the elementary particles, um, those two quantities are aligned exactly as something that is predicted by, uh, by the X mechanism, right? So this is really uh, an experimental demonstration that the X mechanism is responsible for the mass of the elementary particle. At least the mass that we have been observed to couple to the X boson. So this is the case of the top quark. This is the case of the W and Z boson. Also the bottom quark, uh, the tau leptons. And here there is a muon that uh, was measured recently, right? Um, well, I'll come back to that, but we don't have yet any experimental data for the lighter particles simply because uh, their coupling to the X is proportional to their mass, so it's much uh, weaker coupling, so it's very difficult to observe experimentally. So this is actually uh, a plot that shows really uh, what was observed at the LHC 10 years ago. So um, the experimentalists managed to collide two gluons, and the gluon interact with the, with the top quark, and at the end of the day, the top quark has a large coupling to the X boson, so this is how exactly you are producing the X boson in your colliders, right? And then, of course, the X boson itself is an unstable particle. It decays very quickly. You know, it took a long time to produce it, but something like 10 to minus 21, minus 20 seconds uh, to decay. And it decays into, uh, predominantly into bottom quark, but this is a very difficult uh, observation, right? Because you are producing bottom quark in many different ways, right? To really to identify the bottom quark that are obtained from the decay of the X boson is a real challenge. What it's easier to see is when the X boson actually to decays into two photons, 
or into a 2z that will decay into four leptons, right? Because then you can easily reconstruct the two photon or the four, four lepton. You can measure their momentum. You reconstruct the invariant mass. And you see that there is indeed a peak that corresponds to this resonance, uh, resonant production of the X boson. Right? So that's really how uh, the X boson was discovered, simply by looking and observing this little bump into the distribution of the two, uh, distribution of the invariant mass of the two photon or the invariant mass of the four leptons. Right? So that was really the observation in 2012, and this is actually um, what you see nowadays, right, and 10 years after. So this was the observation plot you know, with a luminosity of the order of few inverse uh, femtobarn, and now we have accumulated something like 30 times more luminosity, and clearly now you see the, the, the peak here associated to the X boson. This is probably the peak associated to the Z, right? So there is no doubt, clearly, that uh, this is... Uh, this is the X boson, and probably, I don't know, were you there, Roger? You were not in the room, right? I was not a VIP. You're not, you're not a VIP, okay. <laughs> so you were following it online, okay, good. <laughs> so that was uh, the historical channel, you know, the production by gluon, and then the decays into uh, two photons or, 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 or four leptons. But in, in the following 10 years, you know, more and more data have been accumulated, and we have observed um, subdominant production mode of the X boson, like for instance, um, production by fusion of two W or two Z, right? This is another production mechanism which is about 10 times smaller than the gluon fusion production. There is also the associated production of the X together with a W or Z, and there is also the production in association with the pairs of top quark. And finally, one very subdominant production mode is the production in association with a, a single top quark, right? And all these things have been measured, have been observed in various decay modes. And here, this is um, you know, how um, the cross-section times the branching ratio compare with the, the standard model prediction. So here, one corresponds to the standard model prediction. And you see that every, uh, every possible channel is in pretty good agreement with the experimental data, sometimes with large error bars that will really shrink when you, accumulated, uh, when you accumulate more data, clearly. Um, uh, one interesting uh, observation, you know, is when the, the X, for instance, decays into two muons, right? I mean, this is uh, one of the recent observations that has been measured. So mu here is simply giving you the ratio of the pro uh, production times branching ratio normalized to the standard model. And here the, the two mu's denote uh, the final state, right? So when the X decays into two muons. And here you see that, I mean, it's 1.2, basically, right, compared to the standard model with a large error bar, so clearly the experimental measurement is still compatible with, uh, with a standard model prediction. Uh, but what is remarkable is that this is one, and this is not nine, right? And this, this nine is what you, would have, uh, what you would have guessed, for instance, if you know, the mass of the muon was not uh, obtained directly by the Yukawa interaction, so for a single interaction of the X boson with two muon, but if you, I mean, another object that you can write that could produce the mass of the, e, uh, the, mass of the muon will be an interaction between two muons and three X bosons, right? That's the other object that you can write that is fully compatible with the gauge symmetries of the standard model. But in this other model, you know, you will get a, a ratio which is equal to nine, right? So clearly the experimental measurement already excludes this possibility and really points towards the fact that uh, the mass of the muon is really generated as expected in the standard model with a, a single interaction with the X boson. Right. So these are interesting measurements, really, that tells you something about uh, the origin of masses. Right. So this is a, a table that uh, reports, actually, the various measurements that have been observed, you know, the various production mode and the decay mode by the two, uh, yeah, the production mode and the decay mode, uh, observed by the two main experiments, ATLAS and CMS. And this is the data that have been used uh, in terms of uh, inverse femtobarn, um, the data that have been used to really observe this, uh, this channel, right? And the conclusion of all this measurement is, again, you know, a, a global fit that gives you uh, this normalized uh, mu factor, you know, the production, again, normalized to the standard model. And you see also the evolution compared to what was measured at the time of the discovery up to nowadays, 10 years later, and you see that basically up to 5%, you are in, in exact agreement with the standard model prediction both from ATLAS and, uh, and CMS. Right? So this is really uh, 10, works, uh, 10 years of work by something like 3,000 people, right? So it's really uh, 
impressive, uh, impressive work that went to, into that. Right? Okay, so now I want to tell you that the X is really a special object, right? And so clearly, this discovery was a, a milestone in, in the history of uh, high energy physics, and many of us are still excited about the X boson, and I, uh, I want to argue that everybody should actually be excited by the X boson, right? And there are various reasons for that. First of all, because the X, you know, is associated to new forces, uh, new fundamental interaction that are different in nature compared to the other interaction that we already knew before. You know. At the beginning, I insisted that the fundamental interaction among the particles are associated to symmetries. Right? But this is not the case for the X boson. The X boson has some interaction with, um, with the quark and the lepton that are not associated to any new gauge symmetries. Right? Uh, you can also see that the strength of those interactions are not quantized. I mean, you know that electromagnetism is quantized. All the electric charge are the multiple of um, the electric charge of the, of the quarks, right? But this is not the case, as far as we know, for the interaction of the X boson to, to the quark and the lepton. They can take really continuous, uh, continuous value, right? And furthermore, I mean, as I say, I mean, those interactions emerge simply because the vacuum really breaks SU2 cross U1 down to U1 of electromagnetism. So the existence of this force is really deeply connected to the space-time vacuum structure. Right? In a different vacuum, uh, this force will be totally different. Right? So that's certainly one good motivation to study a little bit further those, those, inter uh, those X interactions. But I also want to argue that we want to accumulate uh, with great accuracy uh, some knowledge about the value of this X coupling, right? Because those couplings are really essential to understand the deep structure of, uh, of matter and the universe, right? So for instance, you take the mass of the W and the Z, right? These are fundamental parameters because they control the lifetime of stars, right? If the mass of the W were, I mean, much smaller, the, the sun wouldn't have burned for a few billions of years. It would have disappeared almost immediately, right? And incidentally, I mean, the lifetime of stars or the lifetime of the sun is also related to the lifetime that you need for life to emerge, right? So there is apparently here an interesting fine tuning, right? Whether or not it's a, a causation or not, that I cannot tell, but uh, it's an interesting fact, right? So you certainly want to understand what is the origin of these masses, right? And whether they have anything to do with the value of the, of the coupling between the X and the W and the Z. And as far as we know, that's something that we have learned from the LHEs, this seems to be the case, where right? those masses are really associated to this X coupling. Right? So we already know the answer to this question, right? Um, other question that we don't know is whether you know, the coupling of the X to the electron or the muon and the down is really responsible for those masses. And again, this is essential, right? Because the mass of the electron at the end of the day controls the size of the atoms, right? So we want clearly to understand whether the size of the atom has anything to do with the X coupling to the electron. Right? The same is also true for the up quark and the down quark, right? I mean, at the end of the day, those masses have very peculiar value in order to ensure that the proton is stable, right? You know that the difference between proton and neutron is the difference between those, I mean, the content in terms of quarks. The proton has two up quark and one down quark, and the neutron is just the opposite, one up quark and two down quark. But of course, the masses of, uh, of the proton and the neutron mostly emerge from, from the QCD interaction. It's not, not from the X boson, right? Nonetheless, it's essential that those quarks you know, have different masses, right? This ensure that basically, yes, the, the proton receive a contribution from the masses of this particle, which is smaller than the mass of the neutron. And then the neutron can decay into the proton. And this is good because then nuclei can be stable. It would have been the opposite. Then the proton would have decayed into a neutron and you know, nuclei wouldn't exist. Right? So again, we want to understand whether the stability of the nuclei has anything to do with the coupling of the X to the up quark and down quark. Right? Unfortunately, this is a very challenging question, right? I mean, how to access these couplings uh, will remain probably out of, uh, out of reach for the LHE and we need a future collider. Maybe one of the future colliders that I will tell you about will have a clue to really tell you or pin down this X coupling with the electron. For the up and down quarks, this is still an open question whether we can build a machine that will really have access to this, uh, to this coupling or not. Right? 
So there are other couplings also of the X that are interesting. The X self coupling, you know, the X boson has a peculiarity that it's only particle in nature that can interact with itself. I mean, we say sometimes that the gluon interact with itself because it's a non abelian gauge interaction. But the gluon interact with themselves by changing their colors, right? So it's not really a self interaction. The X boson, you know, has no particular charges, right? It's neutral, it has no spin, etc., and it can interact with itself without changing its nature. And this X self coupling is very important because it dictates, you know, the shape of the X potential. And the shape of the X potential is responsible for the dynamics of the electric phase transition. You know, something that took place 10 to minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, when really SU2 cross U1 was broken down to U1 due to thermal effect. Because the universe cooled down, then the mass, uh, the thermal mass goes, gets smaller and smaller, and then you see really this, this effect of the, of the X self interaction. So in the standard model, this uh, phase transition is actually a, a continuous phenomena, right? But if the X self-coupling is different, then you can have a first order phase transition, exactly like when you are boiling water, so you are producing bubbles, you know, in this bubble, electric symmetry is broken, outside the bubble is not broken, and finally the bubble expands and fills all the universe, right? But you can have different bubbles, they will collide, and then when they collide, they will produce gravitational waves, right? So it's really an interesting dynamics, I mean, that took place 10 to minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, and that could be responsible, for instance, for this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. What happens, you know, at the surface of this bubble, uh, at the surface of this bubble, can be really create an asymmetry between matter and antimatter, right? So it's really important to know, right, what is the value of the X self-coupling to understand whether or not we are there as matter particle and not antimatter particle um, because, of this, uh, because of these couplings or not. Right? And there is another condition that is necessary to have this um, creation of uh, asymmetry between matter and antimatter, which is a violation of CP, right? Uh, this uh, charge, uh, charge conjugation symmetry, right? And in, in the standard model, there is basically only two sources of possible CP violation. One is associated to the strong interaction, which we know is very tiny, if, uh, if it exists at all, right? This is called theta QCD, so maybe... You know, some of the lecturers here at the school will explain to you why actually uh, the strong interaction dies, don't, violate, don't violate CP. And there is another source of CP violation, which is this um, mixing between the quarks, right? So this is the famous Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix that is really emerged when you have three families of quarks. The issue is that the phase of this, uh, of this mass, max, mass mixing, you know, even if of all the one actually, uh, this effects are highly surprised by the fact that you have small masses for the quark. And at the end of the day, this really diminishes the effect of CP violation that can exist in the standard model, and it's not possible to generate this large amount of asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So this means that you need another source of CP violation. And it turns out that it's actually possible to, uh, to really write down many other new interactions of the X boson that violate CP. So we really want to understand and measure those CP violating X coupling and understand whether or not it has, uh, they have anything to do with this asymmetry that we observe in nature. So certainly, we have plenty of very interesting questions, very deep questions that we need uh, to answer by doing some experiment and measuring those, those quantities with high accuracy. So really, what is the future of X physics, right? Uh, what do we want to do next, right? We want to do more differential measurement. We want to have access to the light, uh, to the coupling to the light fermion. We want to measure the CP violation. And we want to have access to multi-X uh, multi channel production in order to measure the X self coupling. And all these things, we really answer this question that I've already tell you about, right? Whether uh, the X have a size, whether the X actually makes matter stable, whether the X create matter, whether the X makes the universe boiling, etc. You really need to do this measurement to answer this, this kind of question. So what's next, right? What's next in particle physics? So certainly, as I already told you, right, I mean, the discovery of the X boson has been a big success. It was really a challenge, an experimental challenge, uh, but uh, experimentalists uh, succeed to catch this particle. At the same time, you know, the experimentalists haven't found also what the, the series told them that they will find in addition to the X boson. There is no supersymmetry, no black hole, no extra dimension, nothing, right? So we should ask whether or not the series have been lying for so many years to the experimentalists, or maybe um, the experimentalists have been too naive to believe the series, right? Uh, nonetheless, I mean, um, the future of high energy physics uh, 
is probably you know, a combination of uh, exploration and discovery area together with really a consolidation and measurement area. You want to go ahead, measure with high accuracy all the particles that we have discovered, in particular the Higgs boson, which is a special particle. So, as I say, I mean, 10 years occurs, um, 10 years have passed since the discovery of the Higgs boson, and nothing else was discovered, right? <clears throat> and um, at the same time, there have also been some, some great progress. I mean, for instance, in, in string theory and quantum gravity, I mean, this, um, this notion of swampland that maybe all the theory that you can write at low energy are not necessarily consistent with, uh, with quantum gravity at high energy, or the fact that there is no global symmetry. So all these things actually uh, prompt the theorist, or at least the model builder, to, to reconsider a little bit their vision for the physics beyond the standard model, right? Um, so maybe you know, there is something like non-locality or some infrared UV mixing, et cetera, that could explain why we haven't seen anything else in addition to the X boson. At the same time, I mean, there is also some, uh, some nice progress that try to combine particle physics with cosmology. And the statement that, for instance, the infrared parameters that, that we are measuring you know, are actually function of some field uh, whose value, whose vacuum expectation value, vary during the cosmological history of the universe, or whose value actually goes through a complex vacuum structure, right? So we are used to that, for instance, for, for the theta QCD term, right? I mean, this interaction between uh, the gluon field strength, so this uh, dimension four operators that you can write that a priori violate CP, and there is here um, uh, you know, an arbitrary coefficient in front of it. It turns out that experimentally, this coefficient is very tiny. And the way to understand why this coefficient is very tiny is simply to postulate that actually this coefficient is actually controlling by the vacuum expectation value of a field, the axion field, right, that really explores various value, and it has a particular dynamics, a particular potential, that brings its minimum to zero. Right? So that's an explanation why, at the end of the day, the, the strong interaction died, don't violate CP. And then you can do actually the same thing to understand the value of the X mass, right? You simply replace the value of the X mass by a value of a field that you know, take a different value during the, the evolution of the universe. And then there is some interesting dynamics, maybe due to the weak scale triggers, you know, when, uh, when the X take its particular value that we observe, then you have some back reaction that stops the exploration and the universe is really frozen in, in, in the state that we observe today, right? So it's really a new, very interesting development you know, in model building that is telling you that you don't necessarily expect you know, new physics or new particle at the TV scale, you know, just above the mass of the X, but you expect new weakly coupled particles, you know, this, this field that coupled to the X mass or this axion that coupled to the gluon field strength. Right? So these are new physics that should be searched for in, in, in colliders or elsewhere, right? I mean, maybe in, in astrophysics or in, in, in cosmological measurement, et cetera, you could have access to, this, to these particles. Right? So this is to tell you that actually, if you try to think about the future collider, you should have a broad and versatile and ambitious program that could address, I mean, that could search for new physics at the TV scale, but should also be sensitive to these light and weakly coupled degrees of freedom, right? So at the end of the day, you really need more precision, more energy to become more sensitive uh, to, the, to the new physics. So the bottom line is that really the standard model is not enough. Uh, we know for sure that you know, um, the standard model will break down at some point. We don't know where and we don't know how it, it's breaking down. Uh, but the question for us is really which machine actually will reveal best this breakdown. Right? And at this point, you have various options. You, know, you can collide hadron or you can collide leptons in a circular or in a linear geometry, right? And clearly, people are discussing, right? I mean, there have been many discussions for 20, 30 years, right? And, and why, why is there so, those discussions? Because this, all these different options have their pros and cons, right? I mean, for instance, if you have hadron, it's easier to reach higher energies. If you have lepton, then the background is much smaller, so it's easier to, to see the signal, right? If, if you have a circular, um, uh, colliders, and I mean, usually you have more luminosity because you don't lose the beam. Uh, if you have a linear collider, then it's easier to upgrade in energy. You just need to, to dig a little bit further the tunnel and you add some, some RF cavities that will increase the energy. So clearly, there are some advantages in the various options. What is the best one? Well, it depends actually on, uh, on, on the physics, right? And the physics beyond the standard model, and we don't know yet, right? So that's why it's very difficult to make, to make a clear statement about what is the best, uh, what is the best uh, machine, the best option for the future. 
Oh, I am doing this time, okay. Um, and there is also a very uh, interesting technological challenge of these big colliders. Right? For instance, I mean, just an exercise that you can do, right? I mean, for the energy, you know, you increase the energy by a factor 10 to the, thir 10 to the 30th between, you know, the battery that you can buy in the supermarket and the energy that you will reach in this collider. On the contrary, I mean, for the magnetic field, you know, you will increase simply by four of magnitude compared to the magnet that you can buy in, in, your super mag uh, in the supermarket, right? So why is it so difficult to increase the magnetic field compared to the energy, right? That's an interesting question. I don't really have the answer to this, right? Um, well, maybe that because if you increase too much, you know, the, the magnetic field, um, at some point you will reach uh, the intramolecular field of the order of 100 megavolt per meter, and then you basically destroyed really the structure of matter. So that's why people are actually thinking of a plasma weak field acceleration where, you know, you, you can reach higher, uh, higher gradient, right? But the question for you is, if you take two magnets of what, uh, one Tesla, do you get a magnet of two Tesla, you know? That's something that you are used to when you take uh, two batteries, you know, you add, you add the energy of those batteries, but for the magnet, it doesn't really work like that, right? Um, yeah, so if you know uh, how to do this, this exercise, please tell me, right? Because I'm still puzzled by electromagnetism. So clearly, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the decision will be a, a difficult balance between, you know, uh, the physics return, the technological challenges, and the feasibility, uh, as well as basically, uh, how much you can really convince a politician to give us some money to build this, these machines, right? So, as I say, I mean, there have been many discussions, you know, and there have been some, some consensus that have emerged, in particular in Europe, and maybe nowadays in, 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 in the America, also in Latin America, there have been some strategy process for the future, right? And the strategy, as, at least as far as I understand, it seems that the best way to really probe new physics is actually to start with an E plus E minus X factory. So you will collide an electron and a positron to produce as many X bosons as possible. So then the choice is now to decide between a linear or a circular collider, right? And I say circular collider has the advantages that you can extend in energy and also the fact that you can use a longitudinal uh, polarized beam, right? I mean, and I say it's interesting to, to use polarization because, you know, you have left-handed electron and right-handed electron and those are two different objects, right? So you can really have different processes depending on the polarization of, of your electron and positron. On the, other, on the other hand, for circular collider, you know, you can reach higher luminosity and you could also easily run at lower energy. So you have, you can accumulate a lot of statistics, for instance, at the z-pole, and I will tell you why it's actually interesting to run at the z-pole in addition to running at the z, as a z-factories. So this is a list of the projects that have been discussed, right? I mean, in Japan, there is this uh, option of a linear collider, right? Start, uh, starting as an X-factory at 250 GV, and then maybe you will go a little bit higher in energy, 500, and maybe reaching 1 TV if you want to search for, 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 uh, for Xeno or Gluino or whatever, right? Uh, China has a project of, uh, of a big circular collider, first by colliding electron and positron, again at the Z peak, so as an X factory, and then later on you will replace the electron and the positron by, uh, some, by some proton to reach an energy of the order of 80 or, uh, or 100, uh, of 100 TV. And there are similar projects actually at CERN, which is called the Future Circular Collider. So first you start with electron and positron, first on the Z pole, then you reach uh, the Z pole, and then maybe you go to the TT bar threshold at 360 GV. And then later on, you replace again the electron and positron by some heavy energetic proton to reach 100 of TV. So this is a big circular collider of, uh, of a size of 100 kilometers that will go under the lake of Geneva, and it will keep us busy maybe for, for something like uh, 100 years or so, right? Uh, there are other projects, also there is a, uh, a linear collider at CERN, which is called CLIC, so this is maybe similar to, uh, to the ILC, but it's using a different accelerating technology, right? And what else? Uh, yes, I think that's it. I mean, there is another project nowadays that acquires a lot of uh, interest, is also a muon collider, so Rogerio told me that people were already discussing about a muon collider 30 years ago, but it got more momentum lately, uh, in particular in the US and in, in Italy, right? So, of course, it's exciting, right? Instead of colliding, uh, as we have done so far, colliding electron and positron or colliding protons, then you will accelerate and collide a new, new type of particles, the muons, right? Uh, so, the first thing that you should notice here is that you shouldn't wait LHC to finish to start thinking about this project, right? I mean, 
uh, ILC or even FCCEE uh, could start while LHC is still running in principle, or at least you, you will start digging the tunnel, right? FCCEE will actually start colliding particles after, after the end of, uh, of LHC, something like 2048 or so, you will see the first collision of an electron and positron. But I think the real conclusion is that you should stay uh, safe and healthy if you want to do this type of physics, right? Because the timeline is very long, clearly. So let me tell you a little bit more about FCCEE because, I mean, that's a project that I find interesting also because that's the project that have a chance to really be realized in a big lab like CERN that has all the infrastructure, all the political support, et cetera, right? So as I told you, it will start with a, an interesting run at the Z-pole, you know, simply because the luminosity, so the instantaneous luminosity is very high at low energy, right? While if you go at higher energy, then you lose more, uh, more energy by radiation, so you certainly lose luminosity, right? So this is a luminosity plot as a function of the energy of the electron and the positron. And you can see that here at, uh, at the Z-pole, at 90 GeV or so, you have a very high, high luminosity, and then it goes down rapidly, right? So we are planning to run FCCEE on the Z-pole for four years to accumulate something like 150 inverse atobar, right? So it's really a gigantic, a gigantic amount of, uh, of data, right? Just to give you a perspective, the, the Z-pole and uh, the Z that you will produce at FCCEE uh, will have a rate that corresponds to all the data that have been accumulated at LEP. You know, LEP was an experiment that was running for 20, 20 years or so. Here you will reproduce all LEP experiments in only three minutes, right? So you turn on FCCEE three minutes after, you can switch it off and you reproduce all the LEP data. So you will produce something like 100,000 Z boson per second. You will produce 10 to the 4 W per hour and 1,500 X per day, 1,500 top per, per day, right? So it's really a gigantic, a gigantic amount of, of data that will be produced, right? And this will certainly uh, allow you to, to reach very high statistical accuracy, right? I mean, for instance, you will determine the Z-pole, I mean, the mass of the Z with an accuracy below 100 of kilo electron volt. The mass of, uh, of, the, of the W will be of the order 5 MeV, maybe even more than, uh, smaller than 5 MeV. Right? And clearly, or even the mass of the top will be determined with a, a precision of 2 MeV. So what is really the physics program of a machine like FCC? So as I say, it will have three main runs, right? One at the Z-pole, something that I will call intensity frontier, simply because the amount of data is really comparable to what you are achieving in, in any experiment, like, a, like flavor factories that produce many, many particles, right? And then you have the X run and the top, uh, the top run, right? And there is certainly some correlation among these various particles, and here also given you the rate that you expect of the various particles. So what is really interesting, actually, in addition to the X, I mean, the X is a given fact, right, because you are talking really about the X factory, but really there is some interest about the intensity frontier, right, because you are producing so many Z bosons, right? So with all this Z boson, you will achieve fantastic electronic precision measurement and also QCD measurement, right? For instance, you will determine the value of alpha QCD at uh, at the Z-pole with a, a very great accuracy, right? So you will measure the mass of the Z, the width of the Z, the number of effective neutrinos, um, the various uh, electric precision measurements, like uh, R, whatever this uh, forward, backward asymmetries, and all these things, right? So this will be a fantastic um, measurement to really pin down, let's say, the, the input parameter of the standard model, right? the standard model Lagrangian. But you could also use this intensity frontier to directly probe light and, and new weakly coupled new physics, right? Simply by the decays of the Z boson. So you will be produce, producing 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 Z boson. And then from time to time, this Z boson will decay. It will decay into dark photon. It will decay into heavy neutrinos, right? It will decay into axion-like particles. And because you are producing so many Z bosons, you will get sensitivity to these new particles, new extra particles. You could also be probing some long-lived particle that you, know, you expect in all these scenarios, this uh, weak scale trigger that I was mentioning before, for instance. And finally, you know, because you have also so many Z bosons, the Z boson will decay into you know, big quark or sham quark or in tall leptons, right? With an amount which is much higher, actually, than uh, that, uh, the, uh, the quark and lepton that you will be producing uh, at, uh, at flavor factories like Bell 2 or, or LHCB, right? So in the sense, FCCEE will be actually the best flavor factory in the world, right? 
and you can yeah, achieve a lot of interesting uh, flavor, uh, flavor measurements, right? But in, clearly, in order to, to really um, cope with all this data that you will uh, that you will be uh, that you will have access to, you also need to design carefully your your detector, right? So, for instance, you need to improve the VER testing, the tagging energy resolution, this hadron identification. If you want to do B physics, right? Uh, if you want to do um, electric or QCD, you need some particle flow energy resolution, for particle ID resolution also. Here you need a good tracker, calorimeter, right, in, in order to be sensitive to this missing energy some, somehow. Right? So this really puts some strong detector requirement of all what you need uh, to do if you really want to explore all this data that will be produced, right? So that's really a challenge for the experimentalists really to, to think about the detector that they want to build. So I want to tell you, maybe in the last what, 10 minutes or so, about, uh, about the X, right? So this is a picture, the current understanding of, uh, of nature. So this is the various couplings, the, the coupling of the X to the various particles of the standard model. So this is a gauge boson self-interaction. And this is all um, the interaction, let's say, of the Z and W to the quarks and the lepton, right? And here, this plot is simply showing you, showing you the accuracy compared to the standard model prediction in the measurement of all these, these couplings. And this line here is simply a way to actually see the correlation that exists between those various measurements. So you perform those measurements, you extract um, this coupling by doing a global fit, and you, you look at the correlation matrix, and you see how much these various couplings are correlated with each other. Right? So the bottom line, if you look at the, the normalization of these various bars, is that the electric couplings here are known at the level of uh, per mil, so 0.1%. These gauge coupling self-interaction are known to the percent level, and the X interaction are currently known at the level of 10%, right? I mean, if you remember the experimental data that I showed you before, I mean, the mu parameter nowadays is of the order of uh, 1.05, right? 5% that correspond to 10% uh, accuracy in the measurement of the couplings, right? And this is the explanation of what, you, what we expect uh, uh, in the future, right? So first of all, at the end of the high luminosity phase of the LHE, so something that we will know in about 20 years from now, right? So you can see how, how much the error bars really shrink compared to, to, the current, uh, to the current state. Of course, here I'm using a log plot, right? A log normalization. So the, uh, it's really s a, a, a small change actually means a really an improvement in the measurement. And this is exactly the picture that we expect at the end of this future collider that I was discussing before, right? So of course, assuming that we don't see any deviation, and you do the measurement, if all the measurement agrees with the standard model, then you can pin down all these couplings with an accuracy which is the one reported in this, in this plot. And you can see also the correlation that exists among all these, uh, these couplings. Right? So how do we do there, right? I mean, what is really the, the next step to, our, uh, to achieve this, uh, this thing? So first, certainly you need to build the collider, you need to, be, to build the detectors, but you also need a smart theorist in particular, some QCD people that will do um, high accuracy computation in the standard model in order to really minimize uh, the statistical theoretic, um, the systematic theoretical uncertainties, right? So this means, for instance, you need a better control of the input parameter of the standard model, a better PDF knowledge, better, uh, better knowledge of alpha S, the mass of the, the mass of the Z, the mass of the top, the mass of the X boson itself. And you need really to compute to, to higher and higher order correction all this um, standard model cross-section, right, in order to, to compare with experimental data. You also need to have access to, uh, to uh, phase space limited region. You know, sometimes you really want to go what is happening when the particle that you are producing has a very high PT. So the cross-section is very tiny, so there are very few events, so the phase space is limited, but those events contain a lot of information when you compare with, uh, with, uh, with new data. So you want to control really the standard model prediction in this, in this particular region. And you want also to understand the correlation among the different beans, you know, so usually you, you perform a, a bean experiment, a bean measurement, and you want to understand the correlation that exists with those, between those, those various beans, right? So, <clears throat> so you shouldn't believe really that uh, the future of high energy physics is only in the end of experimentalist theories also have an important role to play in order to compute all these things. And this is particular a plot that show you, you know, um, the higher order correction that are really needed if you want to achieve a 1% precision in the future X coupling measurement. You see that next to leading order here still comes with large error bars, and you really need to go at least to N to NNLO 
to achieve 1% precision in the measurement of all these coupling sites. And this is highly non-trivial, right? I mean, uh, as you know, computing a three-level diagram is easy. Computing a one loop is, is really a challenge, at least for some of us. And doing to two loop or three loop is, is really an art, right? But people are developing these things, and you know, they are developing also nice mathematics, understanding new functions, this polylogarithm, et cetera, that shows up in this computation. Right? So it's really a nice co collaboration between, let's say, particle physicists and mathematicians also. So this is an example of few diagrams that have been uh, recently computed you know, in, on the theoretical side for what concerns the Higgs boson. Maybe the most advanced one is really the gluon fusion production of the Higgs, which is now known to NQ, by the way. Big breakthrough, I think it was one of the first really um, processes in the standard model to be computed at this level of accuracy. It's highly non-trivial and you really need to develop new techniques to compute all these loops. Right? But there is also some progresses in all the other production modes of the Higgs boson with currently this, this given uncertainty, right? So you see that here, even NQ below at, uh, at LHE is not enough really to reduce the uncertainty to, down to 1%, right? So you still need to go further and improve your computation. So what about X physics and future colliders, right? And in particular, FCCEE, which is maybe the next uh, future collider to be built after LHC. So the X will be produced dominantly into two modes. I mean, the first one is really um, the peak, right? The peaks of the cross section here, which is about 240 GV. So that's why you want to run FCCEE at 240 or 250 GV, and this corresponds really to this cross section, right? So you're producing the X in association with the Z boson. But clearly these diagrams, you know, involve a propagator. So when, you know, when the Z goes off shell, you know, when you give too much energy, then this cross section will, will drop, and this is exactly what you see here. When you go to higher energy, the cross section actually goes down simply because of this propagator. And then what is taking over is this uh, production mode by fusion of, glu uh, by fusion of W, right? So this is this, this cross-section here. And when you go to higher energy, this becomes more and more important. In particular, at 360 GV, you have a significant uh, production cross-section. You, know, you will be producing something like 200,000 of X boson, um, 50,000 X boson at this energy, compared to 1 million of X boson that are producing in an X room like this. Right? It's also interesting to see at the, uh, at the cost of producing an X boson. So at FCCEE, those really coming from the running cost, it will cost about 250, G, uh, 250 euros, right? So 1,000 reals, Brazilian reals, to produce one X boson. So this is cheap compared to you know, the production cost at a linear collider, for instance, 7,000 or even 10, 12,000 euros, right, to produce one X boson, right? So that gives you also some, some, some interesting comparison between the collider. I mean, nowadays, people don't care maybe so much about the cost in, in, in euros, but they, they care about the cost in, uh, in, in carbon, right? How much carbon do you, does it cost to produce a Higgs boson, right? And here again, there is some interesting um, analysis that have been done that say that FCC is actually the cheaper or greener uh, collider that you can build. Of course, there is still the cost of the tunnel itself. You, know, you need to, d to dig a 100-kilometer tunnel as a given carbon footprint also, right? Anyway, you can go forever and <laughs> discuss, discussing with a politician about that. Right? Um, so this is some plot that shows you also the sensitivity that you expect in the various coupling of the X measurement, and there is some nice correlation. You know, for instance, here you can see the effect of running at 250, 250 GV together with 365. So the light blue here is only when you have only data at 240 GV, and then you add this, I mean, much smaller number of X boson, but you know, they give a lot of information. You know, reduce the error bars by a factor two or by a factor three, right? And this is really by combining these different production modes. So there is really a nice complementarity or nice interplay between the run at different energies. Right? Um, there is also a nice interplay with, uh, with high luminosity LHE. You know, this collider will come after uh, high luminosity LHE. And there are things that you can do uh, at linear colli um, at FCCEE that you cannot do at, um, at high luminosity phase of the LHE, for instance. L LHE has no access, for instance, to the star mukawa couplings, right? Here you see the bars that correspond to LHE is empty. So this means that really LHE cannot measure the char mukawa couplings, right? But then, um, when you add the information that are coming from um, FCCEE, you, you see that you have access to these couplings, right? And there is other uh, interplay like that. I mean, for instance, here, 
FCC alone has no access to the top Yukawa, simply because you know, in order to have access to this coupling between the top quark and the X boson, you need to have enough energy to produce the X in association with the top quark, with the pairs of top quark. And this is a phenomenon that requires at least 500 GV. And FCCE cannot run at 500 GV, so he has no direct access to this coupling. So that's why the linear collider, people are telling you, well, we need you know, to build a linear collider that can access to 500 GV, because then you know how to measure these top Yukawa couplings. But, I mean, of course, they forget that uh, FCC will come after Ilumi LHE, and then if you compare you know, the knowledge of top Yukawa coupling after Iluminosity LHE, you see that actually all the information will come from LHE at linear collider or at FEC. So you really don't need to reach FCC, uh, you don't need to read 500 GV to learn anything about the top quark. If you want to learn more about the top quark, then you need a collider that will reach uh, 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 one TV at least. But 500 GV is not enough. So this is a kind of a complementarity that exists between the various colliders. And there is also a nice complementarity that exists between measuring you know, the interaction at the Z-pole and the interaction at the, um, at the X boson simply because there is different correlation, you know. So this is the correlation that exists between the various measurements, you know, when you do a run only at the X pole, at 250 GV. And you see that there is many correlation that exists between this measurement, in particular between the X coupling and the electric measurement. And then if you're able to run, you know, in addition to the X pole, if you're able to run at the Z pole, you see that you decorrelate basically the X measurement from the electric, me electric precision measurement. So this kind of correlation plot is telling you that uh, the knowledge that we have after LEP, you know, all the knowledge of the Z coupling is not enough if you want to extract the X coupling. At some point, I mean, simply you don't know, uh, you don't know enough about the Z boson to really extract all possible information about the X coupling. While if you are able to run and produce many Z bosons, again, at the Z pole, then you will have perfect uh, electric precision measurement and then you can go ahead and perform all your X coupling measurements. And this is well illustrated here, you know, this is the extraction of the X coupling without the Z pole run, and you see that you are still far away from infinite electric precision knowledge, right? I mean, this little white dot here is you know, the sensitivity of the X coupling measurement that you will reach if you have a perfect knowledge of the Z boson, and you see that you are far away. I mean, some far away means 50% away also, right? And here, if in addition to the X pole, you add a run at the Z pole, you see that basically, 10 to the 12Z or 10 to the 13Z is equivalent to infinite number of Z bosons. You have, you have enough, enough knowledge of all the, uh, all the coupling of the Z boson to really go ahead and measure all the X coupling without any limitation. So that's why it's important to have a machine that can run at the Z pole and at the, uh, at the X pole later on. There is also some plot that shows the effect of, uh, of, um, of the beam polarization which is interesting, for instance, in particular, if you have a machine that can run at a single energy, like 250 v GV, then there is some, some degeneracy that, you know, due to some ambiguity in the determination of the couplings, and this ambiguity is left, is lifted if you are able to run a different polarization that will break this degeneracy, right? So this means that you, you will gain much more um, from beam polarization than simply the statistical enhancement to the increased cross-section. You know, just statistical enhancement should expect something like 5% enhancement in the determination of the couplings, and here you can reach something like 80%, right? So it's really an effect of this decorrelation that exists between various observables, right? Okay, I think I should stop here, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, right. Which time is it? Yes. Um, I mean, another thing, yeah, to, to conclude, another thing that you can do at FCCEE is actually measuring directly the electron Yukawa, you know, you can really have an electron and positron, you tune the energy of the electron and positron to really reach the resonance. So you run at 125 GV and you produce the X as a uh, S channel resonance, right? And this gives you access actually to the value of this, uh, of this interaction between the X and, and the electron. And this is telling you whether or not the X is responsible for the mass of the electron, right? So this is the only machine that can do that. And after four years of dedicated run, at the S pole like that, you can really reach a standard model sensitivity, right? Which is very interesting. Of course, this is still challenging. I mean, you need a monochromatization of the beams and you really control uh, with very high accuracy the energy of this beam and without the beam spra spread, etc. I mean, and the experimentalists are exciting, excited about this challenge. Clearly. 
And this is interesting, right, because uh, the measurement of this coupling actually also controls the amount of CP violation um, constraint that you, you will extract from the measurement of EDM, right? So for instance, EDM is simply the interaction between the electron and the photon that can break CP. So if the X coupling violates CP, then you can generate uh, an EDM at one loop like that, right? But in order to generate these couplings, you really know if the X actually couple to the electron, right? So in order to extract information about CP violation from EDM, you first need to know the value of this electron you call right? So that's why there is in, in, interesting uh, measurement going on in this uh, S-channel production of the X boson. Okay, I will stop here probably. So I don't have time to tell you about uh, the dynamics of the electric phase transition or the production of gravitational wave that are associated with that. Simply, I mean, just one line comment is that, again, you know, if you have a first order phase transition, you will produce bubbles, and when these bubbles collide, they produce gravitational wave. And you can compute, actually, the spectrum of this gravitational wave, and it turns out that if you have a phase transition at 100 of GV, it will correspond today at uh, a peak of the gravitational wave around a millihertz, right? 10 to minus 3 hertz, so far away from the gravitational wave that are observed today in, uh, at the order of uh, um, 100 hertz or so. But there is a nice gravitational wave detector, LISA, that will be sent in space, a big gravitational wave interferometer that will actually be sensitive to this millihertz frequency in this region. So in this way, you can really probe the dynamics of the electric phase transition simply by looking at the sky and looking at gravitational wave um, produced during this electric phase transition, so stochastic gravitational waves. Um, yes, so let me conclude, right? Um, I'll, I'll conclude with simple analogy with what happens in, in this story, right? Columbus had a great proposal which was reaching India by sailing to the West. And for that, he had a theoretical, I mean, theoretical model as well as a, a technological, um, the right technology to achieve this proposal. Right? So his theoretical model was simply that the Earth is round, right? And actually, the size of the Earth was known from, from the Greek, right? I mean, at that time, they didn't use GV, like the natural unit, but they were using a, a strange unit which is called stadia. And the Greek computed that the size of the Earth is 200. 50,000 stadia, right? And a lot was known, you know. I mean, you can see this beautiful map from the 15th century. I mean, I think this map is still in, in Pisa, if I'm not wrong, right? Some, somewhere in the Scuola Normale, you can find a, a, a copy of this map. So a lot was known with a lot of details, but there was here clearly some, some missing information in the middle. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, uh, so Columbus, Got, got screwed in, in this um, conversion of unit or post-truth statement, whatever. So he saw that uh, the size of, this, uh, of the Earth was only 70,000 stadia. And then he computed that he could reach, actually, India in four weeks. Right? Something that would have been impossible, I mean, clearly with the correct data, 250,000 stadia was too large to reach, uh, to reach India in, in four weeks. Right? So he saw that it was four weeks, so he write down this proposal, you know, right? <laughs> Scale is, uh, is cheap, and you know, the amount of food that you need to, 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 to store in the ship to really uh, go ahead for this four weeks uh, stadium. And he has also the right technology, namely this caravel that was really uh, the only ship at that time that could sail against the wind, and this is really essential to go into, uh, over the Alize somewhere in the Atlantic. Right? So he has the right technology to really to achieve these things. By the way, I think the Viking also had this right technology, I mean, but for some reason the knowledge was lost. And, you know, between the Viking and the time of Columbus, nobody really knew how to, to sail against the wing except with this, uh, with this caravel. So what he did, so he wrote this proposal, he submitted to this um, scientific authority at that time, and the highest scientific authority was the Portuguese and also Salamanca University. And as usual, you know, the referee knows much more than scientists that are writing the proposal, right? So they knew that the size of the Earth is not 70,000 stadia, but it was really 250,000 stadia, even though they didn't admit that the Earth was wrong, right? But okay, they knew it, right? So they say there is no way that you can succeed, so we reject your proposal, right? Fortunately, I mean, uh, the decision of the referee was overruled by, by <laughs> Queen Isabel, and America became great already, right? <laughs> Um, so the conclusion, the conclusion is that uh, if your proposal is rejected, you should submit it again. Uh, and you need the right technology, actually, to beat your competitor. But of course, as a theorist, I would say also that theories don't need to be right. 
but progress needs theoretical models to motivate explorations. Right? So thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris. So we have time for questions. I have two questions. So the first, you said there was a CP violating term you could add with the Higgs. Is that what you wrote? HFF tilde? Is that the well, I mean, there are many, many couplings that you can write that, you know, interaction between the Higgs and the, and the quark and the lepton that break CP, actually, as soon as you go beyond dimension four interaction. I see. So at dimension four, no. I mean, okay. there is only, you know, this, only the phase of the CK matrix breaks CP. But as soon as you write dimension six, there are many new interaction that breaks it. Okay. And there is some nice property of those interactions is that you know, in the standard model, it means violation of CP is a collective effect, that you can move the phase around by chiral rotation. So at the end of the day, that's the reason why the effect of CP violation is suppressed, because it's proportional to the phase of, of the mass matrix, but it's also proportional to the mass of the quarks and the mixing angle, and all those parameters are small. So even if the phase is for the one, the effect of CP violation, which is measured by this yard log invariant, is 10 to minus 24. That's why you don't have you know, this creation of matter-antimatter -matter in the standard model. But as soon as you write this dimension six effect, you know, this dimension six interaction, they will be surprised by the scale of new physics, but the collective breaking nature is totally different. You don't pay a price due to the mixing between the quarks. So this means that you can have really large contribution that violate CP that can be competitive with the standard model, even be larger. The other question was, you only mentioned scalar Higgs. You didn't mention any alternative models. Uh, do you think those are ruled out, or do you think they're... I mean, experiment has you know, found a scalar Higgs, and um, okay. I mean, maybe there are additional particles, like a double Higgs, I mean, a, a second Higgs, or things like that. But most of the source of electric symmetry breaking really comes from the Higgs, and this is, this is well established. Okay. Further questions? Yes. No, no, he's just drinking water. Because <laughs> <laughs> people are ready to submit proposals now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a question. Uh, hi. Uh, how is the uh, measurement, the energy of center mass, of the WW fusion into Higgs? How you can measure it? it? Well, uh, not sure to really understand the question. I mean, okay, here, if for instance, yes. so it depends a little bit how you produce the W, right? I mean, the W are never elementary particles, so you don't collide W directly. So you need to produce the W either uh, radiating the W from the electron or radiating the, elect uh, the W from, from, the, from the proton, right? So you need a convolution. I mean, uh, yes, this luminosity function that tells you how many Ws with which energy yeah. are there as a function of the energy of the electron or the energy of, of the proton, right? And at the end of the day, you do this computation and you end up with this kind of plot that shows you the cross-section for this uh, production mode, right? So it's something that grows with the energy simply because, yes, here you have a contact interaction. And because don't you pay cannot, price of it. You cannot get the neutrinos energy. Uh, so... Uh, yes, so here you have neutrinos, yes, that... Okay, it's missing energy. Yeah. Uh, and do you get um, after the uh, Higgs decay? Uh, yes. I mean, okay. the decay of the Higgs is something that we know very well from, from LHE already, right? So the dominant decay mode will be a pairs of bottom quarks, but again, at the linear colliders, the advantage is that now you can really see the decays of the Higgs into two B quarks, right? Because there is no other B quarks in this process, right? At LHE, the problem is that you produce B quarks many different ways by colliding proton, right? Mm -hmm. At a linear collider with E plus E minus, or I mean linear or circular collider with E plus E minus, uh, you know, you can really reconstruct the B quarks that are coming from the decay of the X. So this is a clean mode. So that's why you have access to many more Xs that are produced. Because basically all the X that are produced at the E plus E minus factory, you can observe them. Mm -hmm. At LHC, it's only a tiny fraction of, of the X that you can reconstruct. You produce many, I mean, more than one million of X have been produced, but the number of X that have been observed in your detector is about a thousand, right? Mm -hmm. So far, yeah, we have seen about a thousand X boson in your detector, not more than that. Thank you.
Any further questions? Yeah. Um, so you've, of course, made an important uh, distinction between redoing the statistics program from LEP at FCCEE. But if the magnets issue with PP machines were resolved by the time the tunnel is built, one push from the community might be just go straight to PP because, of course, statistics at PP is even bigger. So what comment would you have about, in principle, doing FCCEE <laughs> precision physics at a PP machine if the technology well, is there? Yeah, I mean, I think you really need both machines. I mean, FCCHH alone cannot achieve a precision program for the X. I mean, for instance, measuring the top Yukawa coupling. It's true that you have access to TTH production, you know, at FCCHH. But the way you really want to measure to get rid of the, all the background and the uncertainty is taking the ratio of TTH over TTZ. So you need first to know how the Z couple to the top quark. And that is information that you will get from uh, E plus E minus factories. So really to explode all the information from HH, you first need to have access to EE measurements. I mean, if you're interested in the X, of course, I mean, if, if there is new physics at 10 TV, then go ahead directly and build FCC HH. But to really explode all the precision measurement, I think you need an E plus E minus factory. Okay, any further questions? Um, thank you for the for the colloquium. I just have a, I just would like you comment about the CDF two measurements and this in April. And what the do you think it will change for theorists? You mean the W mass? Huh? The W mass. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Well, I mean, first of all, we need to to really control all all the systematics of this measurement, right? It's one experiment that found a deviation which is very far away, by the way, from this world average of the mass of the W. So in a sense, it's even incompatible with itself, right? So that's why it's also important to have, you know, a dedicated, I mean, E plus E minus factory where those measurements will be much cleaner. So the systematics will be really under full control, right? So I think it's it's too early to draw any conclusion. I mean before you know, speculating about sign of new physics, we need to make sure that we really understand the, the measurement, that you control all the backgrounds, et cetera, right? Then, then we can speculate. I mean, uh, but I wouldn't do it myself. OK. Uh, stop. I just wanted to say a final provocation. Would you agree with the following statement? If the high luminosity LHC observes a deviation consistent with new physics at a few TeV, mm -hmm. would you just uh, say that we must uh, build an FCC HH, or still go for the EE? Uh, depends how exciting it is. This measurement is. I mean, uh, <laughs> sure, if there is a clear peak, you know, at one TeV or two TeV. No, 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 no. Cannot be, no, not a clear peak. <laughs> I'm saying the, the big deviation in the couplings consistent with new physics. Uh, tough one, huh? It's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, I think it will take time to build HH and you, know, you will have time to run EE. So maybe, you know, you wouldn't do all the full different run of FCC EE. You will go faster, but you would still want to accumulate a little bit of data right? with the magnets or whatever, I mean, with the detector. But I, I don't think the community at the moment is ready to go directly from a to HH. I mean. Okay, so uh, Christophe will be here until Friday. Mm -hmm. You can also catch him over coffee. I think we have yes. coffee after this. Good, good, good. So let's thank Christophe again for this very thank nice conversation. <laughs> don't forget this. <laughs>